sins. His mercy endureth forever. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what the Lord, hear what the Lord saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Almighty God, who sees that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves, keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. reading from the book of Exodus. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, 
and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me what is his name, what shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. Here ends the reading. Let us read the appointed selection of the Psalter in unison. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh also longeth after thee. And the matter of the Lord. First letter of Paul to the Corinthians, the tenth chapter, beginning at the first verse. I do not want you to be unaware, my brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did. As it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Here ends the epistle.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to thee, O Lord. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood pilots had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all those others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they do. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find not, none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? The gardener replied, Sir, leave it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. You may be seated. Sorry for my voice this morning. I will project. Uh, these are two stories that all of us should internalize in some, in some fashion because they are an important part of the foundation of our, of our thinking about God, our theology, who we are, and why in this time of the year we celebrate the privations of Lent. Now I love the story of Moses tending his sheep of his father-in-law, encountering God in the burning bush that doesn't consume itself in the fire, and knowing almost immediately that this is a place where God is. God and Moses are there to have a conversation with each other. That seems to happen a lot in ancient scripture. Not quite so much, but still it's there in the New Testament. I think it's something that we should hold dear because I believe, that, believe as I have said, that God speaks to us on a regular basis. We just need to cock our ear. But before they get much into their conversation, God says to Moses, who's hiding his face because he feels that he can't look at God, Moses, you're standing on sacred ground. You should take your sandals off. Now, on another day, I, I could preach this in terms of what it says, I think, about climate and world stewardship because I believe we all stand on sacred ground every step we take. But it does give us a sense of what God conceives of as himself. Two different ways of looking at it in this one short passage. God has been called the ground of all being. And so as Moses stands there near the burning bush. God is basically saying to Moses, don't stand on me. That's disrespectful. 
you need as a human being, notwithstanding the fact that I have created you, you need to respect me, and one of the ways I'm asking you to do that is to take your dirty sandals off. And Moses did immediately. And then God gives Moses a holy task to perform. Go to Pharaoh, God says to Moses. Go and tell them, as the spiritual go goes, let my people go. Well, Moses is, is wondering how he's going to do that, really. And in particular, what he is going to say when people ask him, well, you say you came from God. Tell us, if you will, what God's name is. Names are so important in our lives, but particularly in ancient scripture. How you name something and how you come to be able to name something. Those are basic parts of the narrative story. And God says to Moses, would well, tell them that God's name is I am who I am. That can also be translated from the ancient text as I am who I will become. So it is grounded in the present, but it is also grounded in the future. Because it suggests to us that God is not finished even with God's self. That there's a dynamic to all of this, and God is taking himself and ourselves into that, into that future roiling of what the future is going to bring for all of us. God is a participant and a spectator just as much as we all are participants and spectators. What God is saying is a basic piece, if you will, of psychological good health. Know who you are. Be able to express that. Be able to live it out. Know where your little piece of ground is and stand on it and protect it from those who might want to interlope on it. It's a lesson about who God is, but it's also a lesson who we are and what we should conceive of ourselves as being because the interconnections cannot be broken. They are solid and strong. So Moses does walk down the mountainside, trailing his sheep behind him. And he does go to Pharaoh, and he does say to Pharaoh, let my people go, God says. And that, as we know, creates an entire set of circumstances that the rest of Exodus is going to be working out. It doesn't come easily, as we know, either from Scripture or less felicitously uh, from watching a movie about it. We then get to the gospel reading. It seems sort of gossipy at the beginning, a kind of, did you hear what happened? It's interesting as a side note that there are some scripture scholars who try to pinpoint exactly what is being discussed in this passage about the tower and the people who have died and. I think the scripture scholars should have other things to spend some time with because 
that is not even the point of the gospel. But it gets to the end, and Jesus does something that I am very much comforted by. The master is walking through the garden. The gardener is trailing alongside him. And the master sees a spindly fig tree. And the master goes out to his garden regularly and says to the gardener, you know, I've been doing this the last three years while, while that fig tree has been planted there and I have yet to be able to eat a fruit off the fig tree. Cut it down, it's wasting space. Plant another fig tree, maybe that will do better. Now the gardener is a true gardener because he doesn't want to cut it down. Anyone who tends a garden knows exactly how that feels. That sounds right. And any time I can preach on manure is a good Sunday morning. Like doing that. So the gardener, who's a little bit cheeky, says to the owner of the field of the vineyard, let's leave it alone for right now. I will tend it, I will fertilize it, I will try to noodle it along so that when you come by the next time, I'm hoping that there will be fruit on the fig tree. And the owner accepts that as a plan, as a plan. In ancient scripture, the fig tree grew to symbolize the nation of Israel. You see a fig tree, you think of your, your motherland, where you live, where you till your own garden. And part of this story is a kind of parable about the nation. And it is part of that conversation that Jesus is having about people who have sinned and others are not so special, all are going to be cast into the same fire because they are, are all are redolent in sinfulness. And so this fig tree carries the weight of all the symbolism of the entire nation. And the vineyard owner, who is God, in this parable, is saying, let's cut it all down. Let's throw it into the fire. It is too sinful in its in its omission of its responsibility to bear fruit. But the gardener, bless his heart, says, I think I can make this better. I don't think this has to be the resolution of this poor fig tree that for all we know is going to bear fruit in the very next season. So let's give it a chance. And the owner of the vineyard says, okay, let's do that, but let's see where it is in a year from now. Jesus is talking about us. If the fig tree represents the nation Israel, it represents the community of churches christened in Jesus' name. And Jesus is inviting us to tend our metaphorical fig trees so that they will be fruitful. And the thing about putting your hands in the dirt and tilling it and feeding it and attending to it, that's the work that we have been commissioned to do. 
the sacred work that we have been commissioned to do. Because we learn from the Moses story that God's earth is sacred and we need to be humble when we stand upon it but we also have work to do in the earth as well. These are splendid readings, the Exodus reading, the, the reading from the Gospel of Luke, that are earthy and pithy and, and visual. They have everything of a good story, including a good lesson for all of us. Watch where you're standing and walking because you probably are on sacred ground because most everywhere is because God created it. Walk, but walk in humility. And if you have a fig tree, which I guarantee you we all are and do, tend to that. Keep it from keep it from being unfruitful. Because you were created, all of us are created to be fruitful. And when the the master walks through the vineyard the next time and looks over at us to see how we're doing what we're up to. We need to prepare for God to look at us and to look at our fruitfulness. Let us bless the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, our Son of God, the God of the Father of the world. Beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, 
unity, and concord. And grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially Michael, our presiding bishop, Eugene, our bishop, and Robert, his assistant, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that, with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, especially Joseph, our president, Lawrence, our governor, and Brandon, our mayor that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that, rejoicing in thy whole creation, we may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and suffer those commended to our prayers, and all those who, in this transitory life, are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We pray especially for Natalie, for the people of Ukraine, the people of Afghanistan, and the people of Haiti. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, especially Gail, Tom, and thy servants are benefactors, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of Our Lady, Blessed John, and of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Ye who do truly and earnestly repent of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbors, and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and make your humble confession to Almighty God devoutly kneeling. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, the God of all men, we acknowledge and aware of our radical sins and wickedness, which we confirm to our most grievously have committed by God's word and deed against our common God, our Heavenly Father, who of His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who, with hearty repentance and true faith, turn unto Him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, 
and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Because thou hast been my helper, therefore under the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with 